play the newspaper crisis reaches Germany. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, it also uh, reached the US. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, do you see a, a company like the New York Times uh, stopping their publication? Well, it depends on what you mean by publication. Certainly, at some point, they're going to stop printing things on paper because it doesn't, you know, it'll stop making economic sense. Um, but I think there will always be something called the New York Times because the brand is so good. And the question is, what happens between those two events, right? The, 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 the shrinking of, of, of paper revenues, um, which is hitting some places harder than others, will over the long haul, five to seven years, say, uh, lead to a pretty significant reduction in the number of newspapers that are printed at a printing press versus the number of newspapers that are printed because I hit the print button on my, on my computer. Uh, but the question of what to do with the reporters and editors and ad salespeople as the printing revenues go away um, is the much harder problem. Um, the Times has an enormous newsroom. It may be the largest in the world. Um, it is certainly the largest in the English-speaking world, 1,300, uh, 1300 writers and reporters. And it seems likely to me that they won't be able to support that size staff because the... Um, the fact of geographic distribution that was created by a physical newspaper meant that uh, essentially it made sense to have sports writers and people covering international politics and people covering local politics all working for the same for the same organization. It's not as clear that 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 that's true anymore, and it's not clear, for example, that the New York Times needs to have a sports section online because uh, the kinds of things that they cover that are genuinely national news. We've recently had a drug use, uh, drug use scandal among some of our baseball players. Um, that would be front page news. That doesn't necessarily have to be in the sports section. But the daily reporting of how the Yankees did yesterday, I mean, it's hard to imagine that there are people who need that news that don't know that they could get it from someplace other than the New York Times, or that the numbers would be identical no matter where they were. Uh, there may be business cases for having the sports section. That's an example. But it seems to me that as as publications become potentially either hyper-local or implicitly regional or global, um, the restructuring in part comes from thinking through section by section, whatever happened on the paper side, this section either is or isn't part of our mission on the web. And the, and the, the transformation of news organizations from print only to print plus web to web only um, is going to be, I think, principally a transition that, that involves thinking through this is the new core mission based on the medium we're getting good at. Now, suddenly we're talking about paid content again. Desperation or good You may idea? be talking about that. I'm <laughs> not talking about that. No, it's ridiculous. Um, no one has ever paid for content in the history of the world. And the people talking about paid con content right now don't understand that. Um, we are only five years into the internet as a majority medium in the, in the developed world. And that is literally the first time since, since Phoenicia in 3000 BC, since the invention of the alphabetic principle, that there's been anything you could even call content, which is to say uh, pure expression decoupled from any kind of physical object. People have paid for books, they've paid for newspapers, they've paid for LPs, they've paid for CDs. Uh, sometimes they've even paid for decoding devices like radio, television, and so forth. But radios don't get TV signals and TVs don't get radio signals. There was no such thing as content in that world. There was no purely general purpose transmission. And now there is, right? The computer is the radio and the television and the CD player and the newspaper and the magazine. Uh, and so everyone who argues that people used to pay for content is denying to themselves that what we actually used to pay for wasn't the product but the service, right? It's not that I'm paying for the book. I'm also paying for the trucking and the shipping and the stocking. I'm paying for it to be in a bookstore near my house. Uh, and when you look at advertising revenues in newspapers, when you look at advertising revenues and what people are paying for, um, very often the dollar figure that individuals pay for the newspaper doesn't even cover all of the physical production costs, which is to say not only were they not paying for the content, they weren't even paying completely for the physical fact of the newspaper. Um, the other thing I think newspapers don't understand is that good journalism has always been subsidized. Right? There's, there's never been uh, a point where the general public paid for mass market news. 
And the subsidies can come from lots and lots of places. In the UK, some of it comes from the government, Japan too. Uh, for some models, that there are nonprofit models where it's user funded. For a long time in the newspaper world, the subsidies came from shopping malls, right? That you know somebody somebody wanted to sell some clothes, and so they subsidized the fact that you could send somebody to Baghdad, right? But why Macy's has to be the people to give the money to send somebody to Baghdad doesn't seem to me to be a principle worth standing up for. So the real question here is where does the subsidy come from? And it seems to me that the paid content argument, the idea that we're going to create some kind of cartel and force people to pay grossly overestimates the amount to which you can force people to do anything online. And if the newspapers start uh, start disappearing back behind paywalls, it seems likely to me that what will happen is they will, uh, they will slow their demise but hasten their irrelevance because they'll get people who subscribe and provide enough money to keep them, keep them limping along at a sort of slightly slower rate of decay. But the potential to break a really big story that becomes globally important uh, is going to be sharply reduced because if you're behind a paywall, you can't share. You make sharing illegal, which is what, what paywalls are, are designed to do. And there will come a moment where a little paper, or even a big paper behind a paywall, breaks a story, but the version of the story that is widely syndicated and, 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 and becomes sort of famously known is going to come from a different source, from a public source. And I think at that moment, um, I, can, I can imagine at that moment that the trade-off between uh, time and attention uh, and cash, you know, the time and attention of the readers and the cash of the readers, stops seeming worthwhile to the journalists, however worthwhile it seems to manage. And that's, that's really, I think, the big, um, the big conversation around paid content is if you're willing to, to, to run a newsletter, right, uh, essentially publishing secrets to a small group of, of, of steady readers, and you think you can make a good business running a newsletter, you should by all means run a newsletter. But that's not what we've relied on newspapers for. And for newspapers to say essentially, we're just giving up on the idea that we're participating in public discourse strikes me as being... Um, not just a business mistake over the over the short term, but also over the long term to be the thing that opens up the opportunity for startups. Um, if you'd asked me even two years ago, I would have said that most newspapers would weather the crisis one way or another by restructuring. Uh, but now I don't believe that. I believe that five years from now, most news gathering and dissemination is going to be uh, done online by organizations that didn't exist in the 20th century. My final question. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think that a device like the Amazon Kindle mm -hmm. could uh, sort of save newspapers. Yeah, no. Uh, the, the, I mean, people focus on the Kindle and I think the iPod also, the iPod iTunes combination, because they rightly understand that the problem newspapers are having is they're not really very competitive. Right? Newspapers have had essentially a local monopoly on advertising for a long time. And so what they see in those devices is that if you can create an end-to-end -end environment, you can force people who want to use the device to also pay for the content, right? It's a way of essentially escaping uh, competition. What Amazon has in eBooks and what Apple has in music is it has the right to one-of-a-kind expression. It has, the, it has the, the legal right to absolute unique expression. So that if you want to hear a Weezer song, a particular Weezer song, You're not going to be very happy to substitute uh, for for another kind of uh, for another kind of, of music. And if you want to read a Nouriel Roubini book, you're not going to be happy to substitute with another kind of book. News isn't like that, which is to say, because news is about events in the real world, you'll never be able to displace the competitive force, right? So if I want to read about events in Gaza. I'd like to read the New York Times reporting of that. But if the New York Times reporting is behind a paywall or otherwise inconvenient to me, I'll read The Guardian or the BBC or The Times of London or The Independent. The list of places is very long. And the Kindle, I think people who focus on the Kindle rightly understand that the Kindle is helping Amazon escape competitive pressures, but they wrongly understand that that model cannot be applied to news because news uh, is about things that happen in the real world.